thank you so very much. I'm going to begin my line of questioning with Professor Whiting. Professor Whiting, Sharpie Whiting, in your testimony, you talk about the long, demeaning, and tragic history of African American women going all the way back to Thomas Jefferson. And you basically state that some of the contemporary commercial hip hop is simply continuing that unfortunate legacy. I had the privilege and the honor of going to visiting Ghana this past summer for the 50th anniversary. And we went to a slave castle and our tour guide explained to us about the slave castle and an image that's implanted in my uh, psyche is the image of the yard where all the women at a certain time of day were gathered into the yard all the slave women and on the balcony like a second floor balcony. This is where the captain or the head of the castle would come out invariably the same hour every day and selected the women who he would exploit and abuse for that evening. And there was a, a little contraption to the side and with a, a chain to it and a ball and this is where the women who refused for that moment to go this is where they were held at in the out out in the sun the sun was beaming down on them it was a very hot place so it seems to me like it even goes beyond Thomas Jefferson it seems to me like there has been a, that there are two types in the psyche of slave culture, and it's like psyche of, of a modern day culture to a great extent. In a racist culture, there are two types of women, black women. Those who are asexual, the Aunt Jamamas, the other kinds of asexual uh, women who are portrayed into, in, a, in a comical sense by uh, the, um, uh, uh, the the movie, uh, Tyler Perry's movies, you know, Big Mama. Those are the asexual types. And then you have the oversex type that are portrayed in some of the hip hop videos. And so, and it all, as you, I agree with you, there's a continuum that exists my question is, how do we effectively, as a society, how do we effectively intervene with this powerful, powerful psychological force that creates uh, a demeaning, a point of view, reference, image of our women Imus was speaking to that, as far as I'm concerned, and there are a lot of the artists speak to that. Can you ex expand on your concept? Well, that's a huge question, Congressman. <laughs> <laughs> but let me say this. Um, the, the reason why I wanted to begin with Jefferson, because it's critical for us to have historical context in thinking about um, the issues that women in general are dealing with, and black women in particular. Um, and it was very important for me to link Jefferson ideas um, to the, at the moment of the founding of the nation. This is very important. Um, and so I think, although we can go back further, clearly the, the transatlantic slave trade um, is a moment in which, you know, black women were certainly denigrated and, and as you've described that history very vividly, uh, and sexual, over-sexualized and sexualized. I think the, what we are dealing with today, um, and, and well, what needs to happen today, well, one, what is happening today is that young women are being handed their sexuality. Um, they're being essentially told this is what it means to um, be sexy, um, to, um, to be affirmed. 
Um, the images are extremely seductive. Uh, I, you know, as a woman with a PhD, they are seductive to me even. And I think we have to admit that, that, you know, as human beings, we find they're very intriguing. They're meant to be titillating. Um, and, um, and so it's very difficult to resist them. And as I think um, Ms. Fager Pediaco, right, <laughs> um, as she's described, that the particular demographic that's very influenced by it, it's not, it's not, um, it is, it's absolutely important to recognize that a particular demographic is being targeted and it's, it's very susceptible to it. But I think we all in some ways are quite susceptible to it and seduced by it. I think what we do need to begin with is with young women thinking about what does a healthy, affirming sexuality look like. I also think that we really need to explore what does masculinity, male ways of behavior, and manhood mean in this country. Um, I think that there is a movement in this country um, for men to kind of reclaim masculinity or manhood. And part of that move means that women are hyper-sexualized and men embody a certain hyper-masculinity. And this is not restricted to hip-hop. When you can have a, a writer and um, PhD, a professor at Harvard, Har um, Harvey Mansfield, writing a book called Manliness, um, in which he argues that men need to reclaim their manly space and that they've been beaten down by the feminist movement on C-SPAN book notes um, with, with um, Naomi Wolf, of all people, um, and, and arguing that men essentially don't like women much because we're very different. Um, and that women, now that we've accepted that we're equal, we should also be able to accept that we're not quite equal. Um, and so I think this is pervasive in the culture and we have to explore these things in tandem. We have a tendency to want to isolate um, certain uh, musical expressions. Um, but I find Hooters just as um, offensive in a lot of ways as I do aspects of hip hop culture. And I find aspects of hip hop culture quite edifying in a lot of ways. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very reluctant to denounce the culture. But what I always like to say, and I'll, I'll stop here, is that I'm a professor, of course, in a, in a research institution um, in the South, a very well-respected research institution, one that I'm quite proud of. Um, but I have come from various kinds of research institutions, and no one, particularly at Vanderbilt, let me be clear, has ever called me a hoe, <laughs> right? But that doesn't mean that I haven't been treated like one, or people have attempted to treat me like one. And what that essentially means is people have attempted to box me into a category, um, to subordinate me in a certain way. And so the language, I'm a little, I don't want us to go down the slippery slope of censorship, um, because one doesn't necessarily have to call me that, but one can certainly attempt to treat me that way. And so I think we need to explore all of the way, our ways of being and our ways of communicating and disseminating ideas about what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man. Dr. Rojeki, uh, in a continuation of my initial question, in your written testimony, you write that the black experience continued to provide vicarious thrills for white audiences. What do you mean by that? I think for the most part that uh, um, black cultural products have defined um, what it means to be hip what it means to be cool and um, you you only need to look at um, young white males um, my nephew who grew up in a, in a town in upstate New York uh, a town that has no African Americans uh, started behaving you know kind of using kind of a hip you know hip hop lingo and wearing you know wearing certain kinds of clothes and so on uh, that define being cool, and I think that's been the case for a long time. Coolness comes from uh, the notion of being dangerous, um, sort of riding a line, and so on. And um, that I think is a function of the of the kind of culture that we live in. Um, it's very difficult to resist, I think, for um, hip hop artists not to. Uh, respond to a demand that I think that, that in large part comes from that kind of uh, definition of, of, of what it means to be hip and cool. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, um, puzzle um, to yeah. solve. I, I'm kind of intrigued by something else uh, that you uh, indicated in your testimony. You, you point out that the largest audience for 
hip hop, and I, I think we probably for for clarification purposes, we need to talk about hip hop, the conscious hip hop or the gangster hip hop. We need to kind of know which hip hop we're really talking about. I think that's that's one of the things that we've learned today that there's a different variance of of, uh, of, of, of hip hop. But you say that the audience for hip hop is white and that sensational images, I quote, the sensational images of sex and violence are easier to package and promote than more thoughtful and critical messages. Are you, can you quantify, are you saying that the biggest audience for hip hop is not the uh, urban African American community dweller, but it's the suburban white uh, young person? Who, we, is that what you're saying? Clarify that's, that for me, if you will. That's exactly what I'm saying. And I, I can't give you precise statistics because they're difficult to come by. But I've heard anywhere from 50 to 60 to 70 percent of the market for this music is, is, is white. And what do you feel is all, the effect is, is on the white consumer of, of, of this, uh, this music? Well, <laughs> You're essentially creating a demand within the white community for images of black stereotypes that the black community is then creating and being marketed through large corporations back out to those audiences. I think it's a vicious circle. Uh, Dr. Williams, you call for responsibility and sensitivity in the use of free speech. You know, how do we as a, say, a loosely connected, well-meaning group of individuals and organizations, a well-meaning coalition, how do we really uh, rise up to your challenge, <laughs> you know, for sensitivity and responsibility? Where do we draw the line and how do we exercise uh, a, a sense of responsibility and sensitivity while we also honor and respect the First Amendment. Yes, I think, well, first of all, we said that this is not just about hip-hop or rap. We're talking about all segments of our society. I believe that uh, we can begin to paint more positive pictures of black women in particular and, and other women, of course, uh, in whatever we do. I believe we can stand up and we can defend and we can say the other side of it when we hear these negative things. Uh, we can talk about what we know. We can talk about uh, our own culture. We can deny the fact that uh, this uh, this pimp, hoe, prostitute, et cetera kind of thing is a part of, quote, our culture or at least any big part of our culture. Uh, we can also coalesce. I believe that all of us have to and we're all guilty of it. We want our organization to be the one up front, so we talk about what we do. But I think we need to bring all of the organizations together that are looking for positive things and working on positive things for our young people to do. I mean, we can't wait until they grow up and teach them uh, things they need to know. I believe we have to start and we have to stop blaming everything on the parents and saying, well, the parents ought to take care of their children. The parents ought to decide what they look at. We have to understand that there are many parents themselves who don't know what to do. Also, there are many parents who are not wealthy, like many of the men we saw earlier today. These parents have to go out and work. And when I say work, not just the nine to five, many of them are working a second and a third job at night, and they're not there to supervise their children, not because they don't want to be, but we need to begin to look at all families as our families. And uh, as the, the, the popular saying is, it takes a village to raise a child. We just all have to accept more responsibility for doing that. But again, because mass media can affect so many people, I think we have to keep telling them that they have a responsibility to show something else. They have a responsibility to show that positive side of, of, of all of us and uh, not just uh, do things that would put us down because that's what we see so much. Uh, we know that, for instance, it was not intentional today, but women were last uh, to come on. Uh, we have to start lifting women up who are trying to do things and trying to better life, life in our community. We need to put them out front. We went through it in the IMAS incident. We saw 
people that I love and respect out there speaking for women, but they were all men. We need to hear the voices of women more. We need to feel the pain of women when these things are happening to us. And men need to stand up more and be in defense of women, uh, just as we often have to hurt sometimes, but defend our brothers sometimes. We want to see that same thing. We want to see the members of this committee uh, not making excuses, as unfortunately I heard some members of Congress today, and defending. We have to forget about the fact that somebody gives $5,000 or $10,000 to our campaign or to our social events, and we have to look at what is right not just as what what is expedient for us to do to get those five thousand or ten thousand or you know twenty thousand whatever the point is we've got to look at the harm that this is doing to the people and listen to the voices of the women who are saying this hurts me Isaiah this hurts me to all of the men who decide what hurts and what does not hurt us I mean, you, you can see the pain. I mean, as you looked at women today, I'm sure you saw the expression on some of our faces as we sat through hours of people deciding what's good for us and what's not good for us. We need to be involved. We've got to be at the table if we're going to make a difference. But again, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I mean, I'm just preaching to the yes. choir now, I know, but you asked the question. I sure did. Let me just say that when I... When I heard the testimony uh, about Isaiah Thomas, you know, I kind of cringe. I, I know the, the Thomas family, and I know that Isaiah uh, ha have to love his mama. Yes. Yeah. All right? And his mama's a strong woman. She is the reason why he is the Isaiah Thomas. That's right. All right? And so uh, I don't know whether he made the connection in that statement between his African-American black woman mama and the, uh, uh, the uh, person that he was discussing when he made those unfortunate yeah, and absolutely. I think uh, wrong, uh, wrong-headed wrong remarks. You know, that's what some of us, we forget. Yeah. You know, they, uh, it, be it not for black women, you know, black yeah. men would not be even as far along as we are. You know, and I take my hats off to the black women who have really, you know, Thank you. carried the ball. Thank They've you. Been fathers uh, and mothers for us. Okay. Yes, Dick Gregory was here this morning, and he often says that the two most important entities in our community are the black church and black women. Now, the black church obviously includes lots of good men. And so we're, we're talking about there's good people out there all over. We just have to bring them out and force them to stand up and talk about this thing. I don't think the black church has yet dealt with this issue. We have to encourage them and challenge them and say, you too have a responsibility to deal with this issue. And on the other hand, we often hear black women have some things that we have to do in order for us to be treated differently. Well, that's what those, those of us at this table and many in this audience are trying to do. We try to be role models for our children. We're not like many athletes who say, I'm not, it's not my responsibility, I'm not a role model. Every time a black person is educated, man or woman, we have the responsibility to give back to our community, to be a mentor for those young people, to lift their horizons and to challenge them to be better than they are. You know, we wake up in the morning and of course, you know, our breath smells a little bad or we don't look so great. But we put our best face on when we get ready to go out. And that's what we have to continue to show our children. You have a responsibility to do some things. My mother reared nine children without the benefit of a father in our home. And I'll tell you, my mother always told us, baby, you have to get up in the morning and go places like you. You're somebody special. You have to put on your best. Whatever that is, mm -hmm. look like somebody special, going to do something important. And she says, I can't be with you all the time. All I can do is mm -hmm. teach you what you need to know to survive. But you've mm -hmm. got to live your own life and die your mm -hmm. own death. And somewhere in between, you've got to justify Boy. your existence. And I find black mm -hmm. women all across this country justifying mm -hmm. their existence yeah. every day. And I just say, yeah. right on, sisters, yeah. and right on to the good brothers yeah. who are helping them. Yeah. I, I, just, I just want to add... Uh, that there is, um, we try desperately. That's why we in the National Congress give a Good Brother Award every year. <laughs> we, I try desperately to get uh, 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 one of the women 
hip hop artists to appear uh, on the panel with, with the hip hop uh, with panel two. There are no women who are, as far as I know, who are CEOs of the parent company. Now we certainly could have had record or TV uh, uh, produ or not producers, but matter of, matter of presidents. We could have had one of them to participate, but we wanted to get the the key decision makers, and that's the reason why panel one didn't have a black woman on it, and panel two we just couldn't get an artist. Well, we just thank you for bringing Master P because I think he did speak for many of us and what we were thinking and feeling here, and he has offered to work with us and we to work with him, and we just look forward to hearing from more people like that who are willing to. As you know, there is not even an image of a black woman in the United States Capitol today uh, in, in remembrance of one. And fortunately, we're going to have one soon, that of Sojourner Truth. And hopefully, things like that can begin to make it clear that black women are important. They have been important in this society. And we do many things to make this country work. And we're always willing to do what we ask someone else to do. Sojourner Truth, by the way, is the woman who will be 